morning, everybody. My name is Connor Flanagan, and I'm the assistant director here at the Southampton History Museum. And today we are going to be having our last in the Southampton's 20th Century Influencers uh, Lecture Series, today talking about Gary Cooper, a Hollywood icon. So without any further ado, we can go ahead and get started. Normally I have to introduce somebody else, but now I'm just doing it myself. So Cooper was born Frank James Cooper on May 7th, 1901 in Helena, Montana, which is approximately 2,300 miles from Southampton. Now, you might be asking yourself, if Cooper was born so far away and not from around here, why are we talking about him? Fair question. Um, while not directly connected with the area, uh, Cooper's presence was felt here by many people, um, and today a lot of people still have personal stories and connections with Cooper, as he did spend a good amount of his adult life in this area. Um, before we get to his direct connections to Southampton, we'll dive through his life story and learn a little bit about the man uh, that was here that many people might recognize and know. Cooper's parents were English immigrants, his father Charles Henry Cooper came to the United States in 1884. Uh, he was a lawyer and was on the Montana Supreme Court from 1919 until 1924 when he resigned from the position. Uh, Charles married his wife, Alice, uh, on March 24th, 1894. He actually went back to England for that marriage. He got married in the uh, Kent area and then came back to the United States uh, where they had two sons, Arthur and Gary. Uh, well, Frank, who later would be known as Gary. Uh, in 1906, they purchased a seven bar nine cattle ranch, um, which was in Montana nearby Craig. Um, and in 1909, Alice took the children to England to attend the Dunstable Grammar School. While there, uh, Gary would focus on studying Latin, French, and English history until coming back to the United States around 1912. Um, and at around 15 years old, uh, Gary was actually injured in a car accident, uh, damaging his hip. And a doctor gave him the advice of participating a lot more horseback riding as a way to heal the injury, which was actually a misguided uh, doctor's prescription, I guess, uh, which gave him his, his uh, standard sort of awkward walk and weird gait that many might have noticed if you've watched any of his films in the past. And what we have here is the Dunstable School that he attended, um, a young, uh, Gary Cooper in his cowboy garb that he'll definitely wear more in his life, and a picture of Gary as an adult with his two parents. Cooper left high school to become a full-time cowboy after about his 10th grade year. Um, he would later return in around 1919 at the request of his father, um, and when he returned, the, his English teacher named Ida Davis was the first to push him into acting. Um, he was also, he also got into taking uh, college classes while in high school, and those were primarily around art, as he wanted to become an artist. Uh, in 1922, he enrolled in the Grinnell College, and he left school abruptly in 1924 to pursue an art career in Chicago. Um, funny enough, while in school, he was not admitted to the school's drama club. Um, when uh, he would return to Helena shortly after his time in Chicago and start working for local newspapers. Uh, we can see one of these said cartoons right here. This came from the Helena Independent from November 2nd, 1924. Um, and this is actually Cooper right here in his college class photo. Um, but in 1924, when his father resigned from the Montana Supreme Court, they moved to California as his father had inherited some properties there. Uh, in a will and decided to move there to work instead of uh, remaining on the Supreme Court. And he asked Cooper to come with him. And while in California, he began taking extra work and stuntman work in the film industry, working in uh, mostly Westerns. And this is when he would meet fellow Montana cowboy, Jay Slim Talbot, who helped him get more work as a stuntman as they became good friends. And here we have uh, Jay Slim Talbot here. And later on in life, and when Cooper became the movie star that he was, uh, Slim ended up being his stunt double many times. So here we have the beginning of his silent film career in 1925. Uh, his debut film, Dick Turpin, he was an extra. Uh, his second film, The Trail Rider, he was a writer, not the titular writer, just a writer. And his fourth film, Riders of the Purple Sage, again, reprising the role of writer. 
Um, he was an experienced horseback rider and he found steady work in the Western genre of films um, because of his ability to be a uh, great horseback rider. He was a big guy. He was about six foot three. So he looked very good as a tall, menacing extra in the back. Um, but he found the work to be very tough and cruel. Um, many times they would essentially just go at the camera with a horse and purposely just throw themselves to the ground. No mats or protection like many of them have today. Um, eventually he would hire casting director Nan Collins to help improve his career. And she was actually the person that suggested going by the name of Gary Cooper, as there was too many Frank Coopers in the film industry at the time. So that is where they got the name Gary as his uh, film name. So Cooper was also in some non-Western films in this time, uh, notably The Eagle as a masked Cossack, and in the very popular famous movie Ben-Hur, <clears throat> Ben-Hur as a Roman guard. On June 1st, 1926, Cooper would sign with Samuel uh, Goldwyn Productions for $50 a week. Uh, doesn't sound that great right now, but in today's money, that would be approximately $812 today, which is not too bad uh, for just getting into a brand new career. Um, as we move forward, his first feature film uh, was in 1926's The Winning of Barbara Worth as Abe Lee. Uh, with this film, he would then sign to Paramount Pictures for $175 per week, which is approximately $2,842 today, which is not that bad. It's a pretty decent, uh, pretty decent pay uh, one year into his career, going from $80 a day uh, all the way up to $170, or sorry, $80 a week to $175 per week. A really great increase that he had there. And the picture we actually see here of Gary Cooper was from the film, The Winning of Barbara Worth. Uh, he wasn't the main star in the film, but he was now one of the main players in these movies rather than an extra or background character. He would then be in several more high profile films in movies like Children of Divorce, Arizona Bound, Wings, and Nevada. And now you can actually see here on Arizona Bound, Gary Cooper's name very big and bright right in the top. And down here as well in Nevada, you have Gary Cooper's name right on the title. Uh, this is because as time went on, people got to see that Gary Cooper was, he was big, he was handsome, he was a, a good actor, and he very quickly was able to raise through the ranks with all these films coming out in 1927, with his career starting just two years before. He became massively popular, mostly with the female moviegoers, and in 1928, Lilac Time came out, uh, star co-starring Colleen Moore, which was a huge success. Uh, the first film... Uh, this was the first film to have synchronized music and sound effects. Uh, throughout his career, uh, one could guess because of how good looking he was and that he was a single guy for most of his uh, early career, that he was linked to a lot of the many starlets in the industry. Uh, before he was married, uh, he was linked with Clara Bow, who was said to have actually advanced his career and helped get those roles in Children, Divorce, and Wings. And in 1928, he was then linked with Evelyn Brent. Uh, we can see Clara Bow here and Evelyn Brent here, both with Gary Cooper. As time went on, <clears throat> he quickly just rose through these ranks and became a massive Hollywood star. Uh, 1929, The Virginian came out, which was his first talkie. Um, this film, as well as all the other previous work that he had done in the realm of the Western, had sort of helped to create what we know today as the archetypical Western hero, the strong, silent type who stands in the back but is overtly courageous and just. Um, Many silent film stars couldn't really make the transition to working in these uh, talkies or these uh, sound films. Um, today, you might hear you have a, a voice for radio, meaning you're not great looking, but your voice is great. Um, and this time, somebody might look great, but they can't talk. They might stumble over their words or, or have a voice that just doesn't sound as great. Um, but Gary Cooper was known to have a very deep, slow voice that sounded great on these old films. Uh, he would soon be cast in many other great Westerns, such as Only the Brave, The Texan, Seven Days Leave, A Man from Wyoming, and The Spoilers. But he would also continue to branch out uh, while primarily working Westerns, also working in many other movies like 1930s Morocco, which was not a Western. Um, one story from this filming, um, it was directed by Joseph von Sternberg, uh, who was a German director, 
and was massively dismissive towards Cooper the entire time, mostly focusing on Marlene uh, Dietrich, who is the his co-star in the film. And on one occasion, the director began screaming and shouting in German at Cooper, who was uh, six foot three, who then approached the five foot four director and picked him up by the collar and gave him good uh, yelling at to not be so dismissive at him while filming. Later on, uh, he would meet Lupe Velez while filming the Wolf Song in 1929, and they began a two-year relationship, which was anything but stable. Um, during their relationship, Cooper was said to have had an affair with multiple women, like his Morocco co-star Marlene Dietrich, um, and many biographers have also made claims that Cooper was in a relationship with actor Anderson Lawler. Uh, Cooper and Lawler lived together for a time from 29 to 1930, and Lawler was known to be gay in his personal life, and, and uh, I read somewhere that he had journals about them going on vacations together, um, but one of Velez's biographers claimed that she allowed their relationship to continue as long as she could participate um, and be involved. But during their relationship, Velez is said to have been a violent towards Cooper as well and actually fired a gun at him in a train station in 1931 after their breakup. All this being said, uh, much of their relationship seems to fall somewhere between the truth and Hollywood gossip, which I think if you look into the Hollywood today of any major actors in their lives, I think we see all these sort of same through fairs where you have these outrageous claims, which might be true, might not be true, and somewhere in the middle. After this relationship, uh, he went on a trip to Europe. Uh, by mid-1931, Cooper was not doing well physically. Um, some placed the blame on his tumultuous relationship with Lupe Velez and others on the making of 10 films in two years. Most of these films being Westerns or action-based movies, which required a lot physically of Cooper, uh, riding horses, doing stunts, things like that. Um, it, but with, without getting into figuring out what exactly caused the problems, Cooper did lose over 30 pounds and was suffering from anemia and jaundice. Uh, he would leave for Europe and begin an affair with the Countess Dorothy D. Frasso. Uh, together, they would travel Europe, visiting museums, art galleries, and the French and Italian Rivieras, as well as going a 10 week big game uh, hunting safari in East Africa. Uh, upon coming back to the United States in 1932, he was ready to work and he got back to negotiating with Paramount and was able to up his deal to $4,000 per week or $83,942 today approximately, which is not that bad of a deal. Um, in 1932 and 33, these were big years for Cooper where he came out with some really fantastic films. Um, a Farewell to Arms was the first Ernest Hemingway novel to be made into a film and was one of the most commercially successful films of 32. Uh, Cooper was praised for his intense and emotional performance. Even though Ernest Hemingway himself described the film as an abomination, um, he said that there was something about Gary Cooper that he really enjoyed. Uh, in 33, he was co-starred in Designed for Living with Miriam Hopkins and Friedrich March. Um, this was one of the top 10 highest grossing films of 33 and all three of the lead actors received big attention and were all in the peaks of their careers. Uh, Cooper was singled out for his versatility now showcasing his ability to do light comedy as well as being known for his dramas and Western work. In August of 33, he actually changed his legal name to become Gary Cooper. And for the next few years, he would continue to be in many of the top films in both the United States and Europe. Veronica Rocky Balfi was born in Brooklyn on May 27th, 1913 to Veronica Gibbons and Harry Balfi Jr. Uh, her parents divorced when she was young and she went uh, to Paris to live with her mother. She did not see her father for many years, but kept in touch with her grandfather who owned a ranch in California and her mother would remarry with successful Wall Street financier, Paul Shields, bringing Rocky back to New York. Uh, Rocky would graduate from the Todd Hunter School and the Bennett School and study dramatics. Why are we talking about Veronica Rocky Balfi? Well, she would eventually become Mrs. Gary Cooper. Uh, Gary and Rocky met on Easter Sunday, which is right about this time that we're making this recording, um, at a party given by her uncle, art director Cedric Gibbons. They would quietly marry that same year, December 15th, 1933, at her parents' Park Avenue residence. They were both avid outdoors people, uh, Rocky keeping in touch with her grandfather who had a ranch in California. Um, 
and Rocky was also a national skeet shooting champion in her youth. Uh, Rocky was a short-lived, she had a short-lived acting career, uh, appearing uncredited in No Other Woman, King Kong, and Blood Money, and her only credited role in the gay 90s as a, I believe it was Sleepwalking Countess. Um, they primarily lived in the Los Angeles area with a vacation home in Aspen, Colorado, but they regularly would vacation in both Sun Valley, Idaho, and Southampton, New York. Mr. Deeds and Desire. In 1936, Cooper played the iconic character Longfellow Deeds in Frank Capra's Mr. Deeds Goes to Town. Um, many people, like myself, probably much more familiar with the Adam Sandler Mr. Deeds movie, which was based off of this film here, um, though mostly similar in their themes, a bit different in their execution. Um, it was the seventh most profitable film at the British box office for the years of 35 and 36, and Cooper would be nominated for his first Academy Award as Best Actor. He would also star in Desire, another romantic comedy which was widely enjoyed by audiences and critics. Cooper had cemented his mark as one of Hollywood's best Western stars as well as light comedy actors. And in 1939, the US Treasury actually reported that Cooper was the country's highest wage earner at $482,819 in that year. Today, that would be almost $10 million in one year which today, $10 million is definitely not making you the highest paid person in the United States. But um, at that time, he, was, he had done quite well for himself with his negotiations. And also the character of Longfellow Deeds helped sort of create another new archetype in Hollywood that you see today as the everyman hero, somebody that is just uh, poised and genuine and nice and not a over the top Western sheriff star hero chasing the bad guys, just a genuine good guy. Gary and Rocky's one child, Maria Veronica Cooper, would be born September 15, 1937. She developed a love for drawing and art like her father, and she also shared a great love for the outdoors like both of her parents. And by all accounts, Gary was a good father who enjoyed spending his free time with his daughter, teaching her to ride her bicycle and playing tennis and indulging in every other type of outdoor activity you can imagine. Here we see Gary with his daughter as she was young and later on in life, uh, both as adults. In 1941, uh, Cooper began work on Sergeant York. Uh, he, in 42 was the year that it came out and he appeared portraying the World War I hero, Alvin C. York. The films covered York's life from his backwoods days in Tennessee, his stand as a conscientious objector and his actions at the Battle of Argonne Forest, which earned him a Medal of Honor. Um, nervous to play a living legend, Cooper visited York at his home in Tennessee and quickly the two became friends. York encouraged Cooper to do the film, which ended up being a massive success. Cooper would win his first Academy Award that year for his role as York. In the acceptance speech, he said, it was Sergeant Alvin York who won this award, shucks. I've been in the business 16 years and sometimes dreamed I might get one of these. That's all I can say. Funny when I was dreaming, I always made a better speech. And here we have Cooper, visiting Alvin York at his home in Tennessee. The following year, again, Cooper would uh, be reluctant to take on a role, this time because he would be portraying Lou Gehrig, who had just died the year before from ALS, also now today known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, beyond the fear of playing Gehrig, Cooper knew nothing about baseball and was not left-handed like Gehrig was. But upon visiting with Gehrig's widow, he took the role which, would, uh, which told the story of Gehrig's life from his rise to greatness, his struggles with illness, and culminating in a farewell speech at Yankee Stadium on July 4th, 1939, before 62,000 fans. Cooper learned the, uh, the most he could to portray himself as a baseball player for the role and developed a fluid swing. Um, some had said that the left-handed uh, batting and throwing scenes in the film were actually done with Cooper playing right-handed and reversing the uh, film itself to make it appear as though he was left-handed, while others said that he had actually trained enough to be able to participate left-handed, okay enough to fool everybody for the movie. Um, Cooper would not win an Oscar, but he would again be nominated for an Academy Award for Best Actor. And what we see here below is Lou Gehrig himself in 1939 uh, giving his farewell speech 
And here we have Cooper in the film in 1942 during said scene. For Whom the Bell Tolls would be the second book by Ernest Hemingway to be adapted into a motion picture. Uh, while writing the novel, Hemingway actually based the main character, Robert Jordan, off of Gary Cooper's uh, American sort of iconic presence as a film actor. He wanted a character to be um, courageous and honest and the, the best man that he could be. And what the American public saw in Gary Cooper throughout his film career is what Hemingway actually based the character off of. Um, Paramount quickly paid somewhere around $150,000 for the film rights almost as soon as the book was published with the intent of casting Cooper in the leading role, which Hemingway was more than happy to have. Um, the film saw Cooper again, this time playing a war hero, um, an American explosive expert fighting alongside a Republican loyalists during the Spanish Civil War. Uh, the film ended up distorting the original political themes and meaning of the book. However, it has still received mass massive critical and commercial success and received 10 Academy Award nominations, including a Best Actor nom for Cooper. Um, while filming, Cooper carried on an affair with his co-star Ingrid Bergman until around June of 1943. This began to damage Cooper's home life. Um, when he became married, he was able to sort of slow down his personal life and become more of a family man and have his daughter and begin to raise her. But this is the time when that all started to sort of fall apart slightly. Ernest Hemingway himself. As you see here, we have Ernest Hemingway and Gary Cooper, most likely hanging out somewhere in Sun Valley, Idaho. Uh, they first met in 1940 when the production for Whom the Bell Tolls began, and their friendship quickly blossomed from having a shared love of the outdoors. Specifically, they loved to hike and hunt in Sun Valley, Idaho. They were nearly the same height and age, both shied away from parties and both were not very religious until later in life when they both became Roman Catholics. Uh, they would also both pass away in the same year with Hemingway committing suicide shortly after Cooper's death. Um, there are a lot of things that contributed to how Hemingway passed away, but it is probably no, no real coincidence that it happened so close uh, after Cooper's passed away, um, given the intense great friendship that they had throughout their life starting in 1940. During World War II, um, when it broke out, Cooper was in his 40s. Um, due to being older and his sort of chronic health issues with his injured hip and other illnesses he was dealing with, Cooper was not able to serve in the military during World War II. Um, he was, however, involved in the war effort by entertaining the troops. Uh, in June 1943, he visited military hospitals in San Diego and often appeared at the Hollywood Canteen to serve food to servicemen. In late 1943, he, along with several other actors, toured the Southwest Pacific and visited many hospitals and bases. Here we have a picture of Cooper during one USO show somewhere in the Southwest Pacific, uh, reciting his famous speech from the Pride of the Yankees. Patricia O'Neill. In 1949, uh, Gary starred in The Fountainhead alongside uh, Patricia O'Neill. It was not heralded at the time as a major success by any means, but it would have a profound effect on Cooper's life. The 22-year-old Patricia O'Neill um, was Cooper's co-star. Cooper was then 47 years old. He would begin an affair with her um, when the production began in 48 that would last until they broke up their affair near the end of 1951. Uh, one time during their affair, due to mutual friendship and an unfortunate accident, of people being invited to the same place at the same time, Patricia would end up on a trip to Aspen, Colorado with Cooper, his wife, his daughter, and some mutual friends to see the new home that the Coopers were building there. Uh, while in Colorado at this time, Rocky would confront Cooper about the affair, which he admitted to, and that he was actually in love with Neil. Rocky would then tell their 12-year-old daughter, Rocky and Gary would stay together publicly while Gary would continue his affair with Neil. Uh, as time went on, Rocky would date other men and eventually their marital issues would become an open secret in Hollywood. On May 16th, 1951, Gary and Rocky would be legally separated. Uh, Neil wanted a real relationship rather than an affair, but Cooper being 25 years her senior could not give her all that she had wanted. Um, here we have Gary Cooper with Rocky and Gary Cooper with Neil. Uh, 
Due to their during their relationship together, uh, Cooper had also slapped her, blooding her nose on one occasion when actor Kirk Douglas attempted to seduce her. And in 1950, Cooper also had arranged for an abortion when Neil became pregnant without exactly consulting her, more sort of telling her that this is what was happening. Um, their relationship would end near the end of 1951. Um, definitely a tumultuous time in everybody's lives that were involved in this. Post-World War II, Cooper's career drifted in new directions, but he still mostly appeared in Westerns, romantic comedies, and war dramas, which many had mixed critical reviews, but were generally successful at the box office. His next important film was 1952's High Noon by Fred Zimmerman, starring alongside Grace Kelly and Caddy Dorado. Uh, he was also set at this time to potentially have had a relationship with Grace Kelly while still separated from his wife. Uh, Cooper played a retiring sheriff about to leave on his honeymoon uh, when he learns that an outlaw he had put away years ago was coming back for revenge. Cooper was in poor health while filming and was in considerable pain from stomach ulcers, which can be seen in his pained expression on his face throughout the film. However, some say this, uh, this actually helped with the gritty portrayal of the character. High Noon was a huge success and earned uh, $3.75 million in the US and $18 million worldwide. Cooper had actually accepted a lower salary for this film in exchange for a percentage of the profits and, and ended up making around $600,000 for his work. Cooper's performance was widely praised and he earned his second best actor Academy Award for this role. Cooper was baptized early in his life in December of 1911 at the Anglican Church uh, in Britain and was raised as an Episcopal church in the United States. However, he was not a very observant Christian, but friends cited him as being sort of deeply spiritual in his adult life, probably operating somewhere between Christianity and then agnosticism. Um, but on June 26th, 1953, while separated from his wife, Cooper actually visited Rome and had an audience with Pope Pius XII uh, with his wife and daughter in tow, uh, who themselves were both devout Catholics. Uh, Cooper and Rocky would get back together in November of 1953, shortly after this journey, and formally reconcile in February of 1954. In the coming years, he began to discuss Catholicism with his family and friends, and on April 9th, 1959, he was actually baptized as a Roman Catholic before a small group of family and friends at the Church of the Good Shepherd in Beverly Hills. And here we actually have a photograph of Gary Cooper, and I believe his wife, um, meeting with Pope Pius. Cooper would continue to make films until his death in 1961. And in this later section of his life, he would often work outside the United States. Uh, he also continued to suffer from various health complications and had multiple surgeries to deal with his stomach ulcers and hernias. However, Cooper continued to work in action films, which were at times very physically demanding. In 1958, he starred in The Man of the West, which is now regarded as Cooper's last great film. However, at the time, it was largely ignored by critics. In the final years of his life, on April 14, 1960, Cooper had surgery at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston for an aggressive form of prostate cancer that had metastasized to his colon. He had further surgery in June of 1960 at the Lebanon Hospital in Los Angeles to remove a malignant tumor from his large intestine. And on December 27, 1960, his wife learned from the family doctor that his cancer had spread to his lungs and bones and that it was unfortunately inoperable. Uh, the family had decided to not immediately tell Gary Cooper to sort of let him continue on with his life. Um, on January 9, 1961, Cooper was actually roasted at the Friars Club, hosted by Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin. And he gave a small speech there where he said, the only achievement I'm proud of is the friends I've made in this community. And here we actually see Gary Cooper with Dean and Tony Martin around his side, having a good laugh. In mid-January of 1961, Cooper took his last family vacation to Sun Valley, Idaho, where he hiked for the last time in the snow with Ernest Hemingway. On February 27th, 1961, after returning to Los Angeles, Cooper learned that he was dying. He would tell his family, we'll pray for a miracle, but if not, and that's God's will, that's all right too. At the 33rd Academy Awards, Cooper was given an Academy Honorary Award 
which was accepted by his friend and fellow actor Jimmy Stewart as Cooper was not well enough to attend. The following day would announce, uh, newspapers would announce his illness. Here we see Gary Cooper and Ernest Hemingway in their older age, most likely on this last trip. And I will now play a small clip of Jimmy Stewart uh, accepting the Oscar. Hopefully the sound works okay. I'm very honored to accept this award for Gary Cooper. I'm only sorry that he isn't here tonight to accept it in person. But I know that he's sitting beside his television set tonight. So Coop, I'll get this to you right away. And Coop, I want you to know this, that with this goes all the warm friendship and the affection and the admiration and the deep, the deep respect of all of us. We're, we're very, very proud of you, Coop. All of us are tremendously proud. In the coming days uh, after this announcement, he received numerous messages of support and appreciation during, uh, including telegrams from Pope John the 23rd, uh, Queen Elizabeth II, and actually a phone call from President uh, John, F. Kevin, John F. Kennedy. Um, on May 4th, 1961, his last public statement was, I know that what is happening is God's will. I'm not afraid of the future. He received his last rites on May 12th and died quietly the following day, Saturday, May 13th, 1916, at 12.47 p.m. A requiem was held on May 18th, 1961 at the Church of the Good Shepherd and was attended by many Hollywood stars like James Stewart, Audrey Hepburn, John Wayne, Frank Sinatra, Fred Astaire, and many more. Cooper was buried in the grotto, uh, the grotto uh, of Our Lady of uh, Lourdes and the Holy Cross Cemetery in Culver City, California. Um, and May 1974, after his family had relocated to the New York area, Cooper's remains were exhumed and reburied in Sacred Heart Cemetery in Southampton. Uh, his grave is marked by a three-ton boulder from the Montauk Quarry, which we can see in the background of this image there. And I was told a, a story that actually upon returning here, uh, Rocky had sought out um, the man who was Cooper's former caddy when they were here in Southampton. And he was the one that picked out the rock and actually got it settled in the area as the marker for the grave. Um, but now Cooper and Southampton. Um, Cooper was said to have loved Southampton's natural outdoor beauty and spent a lot of time at the beach playing golf and driving around when in the area. Uh, specifically, he enjoyed bird watching the ospreys and always was said to have had his binoculars with him. Um, when Cooper and his family visited, they would often stay at Rocky's family home, uh, known then as Birchwood, uh, which used to be on Ox Pasture Road. And I believe we can see a picture of the house here. Um, each year, the Coopers would spend at least three weeks in Southampton, um, sometimes more. Uh, and they would always stop in at Crutchley's Bakery, which we, we have an old ad in the newspaper right here. And they would always go and get the famous uh, Crutchley Crullers and the Cruller Hearts. Um, there was an interview that my coworker Mary Cummings, I believe, had done with the daughter, um, Maria, uh, saying that you know, they would get the powdered sugar all over their faces while, while eating these donuts. Um, Cooper was given, uh, has given them, uh, sorry, on one such occasion, uh, Cooper actually gave an autographed uh, picture of himself to the people at Crutchley's, which they hung up in the bakery, sort of on the, you know, the wall where many restaurants place will hang up a picture of a famous person that comes by often. Um, and one day, after this photo had been hung up on the wall, his mother-in-law, who lived here, uh, was walking by the store, looked inside the window and saw this picture of Gary on the wall. Nearby was an American flag and an arrangement of flowers, and she mistook these decorations as a memorial and called her daughter in a panic, thinking that uh, Gary had died suddenly. Um, but all was okay. This was well before his illness and death, um, but it was just a uh, a weird, funny story, an anecdote of him in the area. Um, but he was said to um, visit the golf courses, the beaches, 
and really just enjoy the natural area that we have here in Southampton that we all still enjoy today uh, very much. And it's understandable why he really fell in love with the area. The last picture I have here is a picture that was actually drawn by Gary Cooper himself when he was about 16 years old. And I thought it was a fitting end to today's lecture. So adios, um, that is unless we have any questions. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to submit them in the Q&A and the chat function below. And we, well, I will see if I can answer any for you. Um, you can also send them in the chat. Um, I have a few here ready. Uh, so does Gary Cooper have any fans today? Um, probably, most likely. I imagine a lot of people still go back and like to enjoy the classic films and uh, enjoy big stars like Gary Cooper himself. Um, I don't know how many people actually go back and watch silent films. Um, I know a lot of the fi silent films have been lost and you're not able to actually rewatch a lot of them. I know specifically there was one in his career, uh, Saber, Bo Saber, I believe was the name of it, um, is a lost film um, that came out in like 1932. Um, but I imagine today he's still, he's still widely regarded as definitely one of the greatest Western actors and definitely probably one of the better actors of the generation pre-1950. Um, uh, did James Stewart know that Coop was dying? Uh, yes. So I believe some of his family and friends, uh, they all knew that he was passing away. And it was known, I believe, within some of the Hollywood circle, but they didn't publicly announce it um, until after he had been uh, awarded the Academy Award, um, which is partly why James Stewart's speech was so sort of impassioned and he sounded almost like he was choked up while he was giving it. Um, and we have someone asking if the bakery is still there. So no, unfortunately, Crutchley's Bakery is no longer uh, still around here in Southampton. But if you do go to our website, uh, southamptonhistory.org, and you go to our blog page, if you search Crutchley's, um, which I don't want to get the spelling wrong, so let me go back. Um, yes, C-R-U-T-C-H-L-E-Y. Um, if you search that in our blog, you'll see an article that was written two years ago by my coworker, Mary Cummings, uh, where she talks about the bakery, which her, uh, she herself visited all the time as well. Um, I do wish it was still around. I, I, uh, I don't mind a donut every now and then, so that would be nice. Um, but let's see if there are any other questions. Um, all right, got a couple coming in. Um, Oh, so someone asking how to sign up for the Historical Society's email. So if you go to our website, southamptonhistory.org, uh, right on the front page, there will be a place to sign up. So I believe it's a picture of our property, you know, it's a Halsey house, and you just put in your first and last name and your email address, and it will add you to our email list. And we send those out about every Tuesday. Or if you don't like emails, you can always go to our Instagram or our Facebook, and you can follow us there. And that'll keep you pretty up to date on what we have going on. On Instagram, I believe it's Southampton underscore museum. And on Facebook, if you just search Southampton History Museum, it will come up. And then let's see. Uh, Gary Cooper's business success may have been in part to the financier Paul Shields' influence. Shields was also an avid golfer, family to actress Brooke Shields. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, with him being his father in law, um, definitely a good person to have on your side when you're trying to negotiate for higher pay. Um, what is the origin of the mention of Cooper in a rock and roll song? I'm not sure. Um, if you know the song specifically, the name, um, I can maybe levy a better guess, um, but I'm, I'm not aware of uh, the song in question you're talking about. Um, sorry, I don't have a, a better answer. Um, but I think that's all the questions we have for today. So I want to thank you all for joining us and we will see you all next time. Have a good day.